morning, Facebook friends. Helen Arcantu here, CEO of the YWCA of Northern New Jersey. So grateful to have some time with you on this Friday. It has been a hot week if you've been in New Jersey. <laughs> um, and uh, we're just finishing it out. Um, but it was a, a, despite the heat, it was a great week for a lot of wonderful outdoor activities. And um, at the YWCA of Northern New Jersey, as uh, many of you know, we are, we are, deep into camp season <laughs> and with camps, our, we have camps happening all around our um, service area. And um, one of our newest endeavors launched uh, just this week um, in uh, a wonderful park in Union City. And we had a tremendous activity, which I personally got to be part of on this Wednesday. And um, we're gonna tell you all about it. And I'm grateful to have my guests here today Kasia Chmielinski and Harriet Bailey, um, who are the co-founders of the Feminist Bird Club of Jersey City. And as you know, YWC of Northern New Jersey loves to share with you about amazing organizations that are in our community and the work that they're doing. Because as I always say, um, you know, the, we all work together to support our communities and the support really comes from our people like you who are watching, who get engaged in our organizations and participate in the activities, make donations and volunteer. And this is another great opportunity for you to learn about something happening right in your backyard. So with that, let's talk about this fun hobby that will get you outdoors. It'll get you into nature. It'll get you meeting new people. And at the same time, you'll be, I'm pretty confident, just seeing things that have probably been around you all the time, but you didn't really even, you know, know they were there. And so it's, it's, it's just, it's a wonderful test of, um, you know, just your presence and, you know, making sure that you're really present in your surroundings as well. And so with that, this is a national organization, the Feminist Bird Club of New Jersey. It's part of a national it's part of a national organization that's dedicated to promoting inclusivity in birding and providing a safe opportunity for the LGBTQIA plus community, BIPOC communities, female identifying, trans and non-binary people to connect with the natural world. And as I said, we have um, Kasha here who participated this week in our environmental camp in Union City along with Harriet. Um, they are the co-founders of this organization. I'm going to tell you a little bit about each of them, and then we're going to jump into talking about the organization um, and their work. So we will start with Tasha. She is one of the co-founders. She is an avid cyclist and birder in and around um, their home in Jersey City. When she's when 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 um, Tasha is not birding, um, Tasha builds technology products and design tools that encourage the development of ethical artificial intelligence. I feel like that's a whole nother show, Kasha, that we should be talking about too. Um, and we also have Harriet with us. Harriet is the co-founder of the Feminist Bird Club of New Jersey, Jersey City, also um, a science producer, um, where is her role, where she brings stories of bird migration, RNA empowerment, and interplanetary exploration to the screen which also sounds super interesting <laughs> that we'll get into. Um, so welcome both of you. Hi. Thanks for having us. Hi. Yeah. I have to say I had the opportunity as I got to meet them both um, at the event um, this week. And I we have about 20 um, girls that are part of our um, environmental camp this year. This is a first time effort that the YWCA of Northern New Jersey has done, and it's a partnership with the Rutgers 4-H of Hudson County. And um, these, everyone was so engaged in this activity from the onset. Uh, you know, I came, the groups were already broken up into um, two, and they were working their way around the park and um, keeping notes and so tell us um i want to talk about what we did on wednesday but before we jump into it let's start talking about this organization um because people you know this may be new for some folks to learn about it um 
you know, how did you both get involved in it? Yeah, Harriet, you want to go first? How did I get involved with the Feminist Bird Club? Um, it was the first time I actually went birding um, and Kasha invited me. Um, Kasha is the, the reason why I'm into birds in the first place. Um, and we got up at 6, 7 a.m. or something to go birding in Central Park. Um, and I hadn't really been interested, I hadn't known that I could be interested in birding beforehand. So um, the FBC was, was my, my first experience and it was it was a great great one so good in fact that i wanted to start a chapter of the club um yeah it was it was a really welcoming um experience and i learned a lot especially learning that birding is really fun <laughs> so that it was new for you you had never done it before but kasha you had been doing it for some time how did you get connected to birding yeah, it's a. Uh, I actually kind of is pre-pandemic, but not too far pre-pandemic. And I have a, a science background, as does uh, Harriet actually. Um, but I've been building technology for quite some time, so a lot of looking at screens. And um, uh, somebody in my social circle who's also kind of equally nerdy and into the details was like, "You would love bird watching." And I said, "Isn't that like an old man sport?" I mean love old men, great, but that feels like it's not really for me. And she's like, no, it's really easy. It's really uh, easy to get started. All you need is a pair of binoculars. So I actually went to my dad who happens to be an older man. And I said, uh, do you have a pair of binoculars that I could take from you? And he is a very nice guy. So he said, sure, you can have one of my old binoculars. And I just started going to parks by myself. Um, and like many things, uh, you can learn things by yourself, but it is easier and better to learn with people because you just learn from people, right? And things that you notice, they no they, they notice more of, or things that you don't notice, they do notice. And, mm -hmm. and so um, I started to go to um, a few groups and I noticed that the demographic uh, of the groups was uh, older, was whiter, was more more male, and um, it it didn't always feel like the most comfortable place uh, to be in my off time. <laughs> I do a lot mm -hmm. of technology where that is kind of the demographic as well, yeah. and so I I started just looking around at different at different groups, and honestly, a lot of the time I was just birding by myself because I really love being outside, and I love the both the kind of um, notion of like presence that you mentioned in the beginning, mm -hmm. uh, and just really just being focused on something that's not a screen, um, and I, and I also love the scientific aspect we're classifying things and learning a, yeah. a lot about nature, right? Um, and then I stumbled across the Feminist Bird Club and this group looked like a group that was more welcoming and they ended up being a lot more welcoming uh, and just fit more of kind of what I was looking for, which was uh, friendship and camaraderie and birds. <laughs> so uh, that's so then when Harriet mentioned, oh, I've never gone birding, I was like, skip all the other things and <laughs> let's just go to this one and see if you like this one. And that's like probably a really good introduction to birding. And so that's kind of how we both got involved with with FBC National, which is a national organization. And, and eventually they said, hey, we're open to having local chapters as well. And we thought, you know, FBC New York is great, but it, it's a little far when you have to get there at 6 a.m. for the birds. Yeah. Um, so why don't we think about starting something more locally? And that's kind of uh, where this all began. That's amazing. And, you know, I, I love I love that um, you kind of did your research and found found a place, you know, of comfort for yourself. And then you were able to bring it back into your community. Um, you know, what a gift, you know, that you were able to, to, to do that. And, you know, I, I, as our viewers know, I'm always a big proponent of just reminding us all how, how much power we each have and how much ability we each have to be able to make change and to make an impact, you know, with our actions. And, you know, here's, here's a, a prime example of, um, you know, something that ended up being, you know, an interest and a hobby, you know, a, a place for you to be able to disconnect from your professional world and, you know, support your, your other interests and, and look what it's turned into. Yeah. Um, and since June as well, we started in June. So already in July, August, a few months, we've, uh, yes. we've met so many people and, and got some news and, and been teaching kids at the, yeah, in the park. So yeah. So 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 tell us. So obviously now this is the Jersey City chapter of this organization. If there's anyone who's watching, um, you know, who's you know interested in in, in uh, learning more, um, do you have to be from Jersey City to join? 
No, you don't, we don't have any stiff, we're not going to put anyone through a test or something. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> there's really no stipulations. I mean, um, you know, we've had people say, is this only for female people or female identified people? And actually I identify as non-binary, so no, it's not. Uh, and we've had people who identify in all different ways come to to join us. We're, we're really about um, making birding accessible and just um, wanting everyone to feel comfortable. So uh, you don't have to be from Jersey City. There are folks from uh, all over all over New Jersey. We also have had people who lived in Jersey City and moved to Brooklyn who miss Jersey City. And so we've had some people from New York who come over for the bird walks. Um, you don't have to be a certain age range or anything. And we try to also have extra binoculars on hand and books and we're very friendly. So, um, you know, you don't have to be anything in particular except like a good person. You should be a good person um, in order to join us. Yeah. Yeah, you have to be a bird. I think that's a few questions we've had uh, people are like we've never gone birding and i don't even know how you do it um so yeah we encourage everybody at all levels to to come and join so one of the things i um witnessed in terms of watching the, the you know the two of you work with our group is um you know and which i was really struck by is that here we were in washington park which is in a very urban area so people may not think about birds being, I was going to say nested, almost no pun intended, but nested, you know, right around us in really urban areas. I mean, sometimes we always think about animals, um, you know, and, and, you know, birds and, you know, out in nature in, in more, you know, um, open kind of less city like areas, but here they are. And there were so many of them and, and, you know, you had this great, a uh, little visual of, and there it is, there it is, of all the different birds that were in the area. Yeah, I, I was so impressed with that. And then and then the groups could walk around and see who they could identify. Um, so, so, and I, this is gonna sound like a silly, I don't know if it's a question or a statement, but birds are everywhere. So this is really something you could do anywhere, right? Yeah, truly, yeah, it, it, it really is. And, and New Jersey is, is actually really great because there's all these little Pockets. You might think that I mean, with its industrial past, that um, that it would be all built up and inaccessible. But there's all these um, little restoration um, projects and wetlands, and there's the meadowlands nearby. Um, I actually I got this. I, I live in this apartment. And I chose it because it overlooks the Harsima Cemetery. So I have some have some trees there. It's just like all it takes is a tree or even mm -hmm. even a puddle i was walking yesterday and there was a puddle and there were these sparrows it's so hot these sparrows were just splashing around in it so yeah but birds are everywhere and they don't need they need they do need a lot and we should definitely be protecting their habitat but they you know they can they can be around us with you know just a tree yeah and i think it just takes um becoming aware of it i mean i think we saw this with the with the young uh people uh, a few days ago when we were doing the summer camp where in the beginning we were kind of joking around and saying so like who's a bird expert here uh but it turns out they kind of all were i mean they all knew something they all knew a few birds off the top of their heads they could they some of them knew some of the calls that they make and it was just like we are steeped in it right we're nested in it with the birds um and and i think we don't realize that. Um, but once you start looking around, you realize, actually, there are birds everywhere because it's not, you know, city or nature. You know, the city is a form of nature and there's, it's mm -hmm. just different and it's impacted by what we have done to the land mm -hmm. and the space. Um, but for example, there are a lot of, um, you know, raptors because our buildings are kind of like cliffs. And so they've adapted quite well um, to this man-made ecosystem. Um, and so you have, you know, peregrine falcons and red-tailed hawks and other types of, of birds that you would find normally in cliffs because our buildings are kind of like cliffs. Um, and so when you start to look around, uh, A, I think you'll know more than you think you do already, and B, it, it, they're everywhere. So um, it's it's actually really accessible, honestly. Yeah, and, and again, it's, it's um, you know, as you noted, I mean, you just need to be able to, you know, make your way around the location that you're looking in and have, a, good pair of binoculars, although some of them you could see without the binoculars even. So if you didn't have any, um, you know, you really had the ability to kind of make a check. So the park that we were in and the activities, you know, that you did with the um, young people that we worked with on Wednesday, um, what 
and I know you had that great grid of all the different birds. So were, was that, were that all the different birds that are native to Jersey city for the most part? Um, and um, is, are there some that are really more likely, but you know, we're more likely to see in, is that, that being their natural, natural habitat than others? Yeah. So there's, um, there's actually a really quick way to take a look if people are, you know, watching this now or watching it later. If you go to ebird.org, um, that is an amazing resource uh, that's kind of citizen science um, related out of Cornell. And you can go and just look at all of the hotspots on a map around you and you can see where people have logged information of where they've seen birds. So actually to create that list that um, Harriet was showing, uh, I first took a look at what birds have been seen in that area and kind of the most uh, likely birds. If you actually look at how many birds have been seen, different types of species across New Jersey, it's like almost 500. So obviously it's not 500 birds on that sheet, but mm -hmm. we kind of triangulated and said, based on the hotspots of birds in this area around that park, what are the most likely birds? And then we actually did like, uh, we kind of cheated a little bit and we did a little field trip a few days before and yeah. we went to the park and we scoped it out and we said like, what are we seeing here? And you know, just like a, a nerdy bird story, we walked in and we were looking, we're like, okay, pigeons, you know, sparrows, got it, got it, got it, starlings. And and then we saw this little raptor just flying around and realized that there is a kestrel that just lives in that park. Wow. And we were just losing our minds. And these guys were like playing basketball around us. And they're like, what are they looking at? You know, we're like, have a bit of like, oh my God, do you see? You know, so so we did a little scoping ahead of time. But yeah, those those are kind of the most likely birds based on the um, the scientific data that's on that site and mm -hmm. also our own observations from from walking around. And for those of you watching, we put the link for ebird.org in the comments here so that you can do your own research when you are in, you know, different environments and kind of check out, you know, um, which birds might be the most um, prevalent, you know, in the area that you're in. Um, and also, as you're watching, I just want to make sure to note, um, I know as soon as I got introduced to this organization, I started following them on Instagram, and you should too, and it's F. B, C, and tell me what's after that. Of, it's on the, it's right there. Dot, F, dot B, C, dot J, C. I was waiting for it to scroll yes. past. Yes. I, was, I was too fast. Um, but it was, it's F, B, C, dot J, C. And it's a great way for all of you watching to just stay connected to what um, this organization is doing, where they are, and what beautiful birds they're seeing right in their community. And again, I also encourage you to connect um, to their organization and support them. Um, again, it's so important. Our, you know, nonprofits all survive because of support from organization, uh, from the people in our communities um, who embrace our work. And so whether you're thinking about the national organization or this local Jersey City chapter, um, it's so important for you to, to think about supporting. So another question for you, do seasons impact which birds we will see? So if we were in Washington Park and we were obviously there on a sweltering hot day, I'm not sure for New Jersey that it could have been too much hotter on that day. It was a tough one, right? But even with that, I have to say everybody was so engaged and willing to walk around and participate, which tells you something about the activity. But if we were to do that again in November and then do it again in March, would we be seeing different birds? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's um, coming up soon. Um, I guess at the end of August and September is migration season, which is very exciting. Um, debate is out whether spring migration or fall migration is, is uh, more <laughs> spectacular. But um, that's when obviously all the birds that were nesting and breeding further up north um, uh, migrate down for the winter. So that's why we get the, the 485 species through. Jersey City is like a, it's a very important um, spot along the um, the Atlantic uh, flyway. Um, so yeah, we have all these warblers. Um, there's the hawk migration that goes over the Palisade Cliffs, um, and yeah, all these species that just come and visit for a few weeks or something. So we'll definitely be having some bird outings then um, to to try and see as many as possible. Not to say that the resident birds aren't exciting too. <laughs> but it, but it, it speaks to the fact that that's why it's something that's continually engaging because you not only have, you know, as you said, the resident birds who are around, but that there's always, you know, other birds that are, yeah, no pun intended, flying in and flying out <laughs> you know, to join. To join. 
Um, so that 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 definitely keeps it uh, exciting. And so one of the things that I was also struck with that you that you so again for our viewers, what was wonderful about this activity, and I do encourage you all. To, let me just shout out um, this camp that we did was 100% free to um, the um, young people that joined it, and it was ages nine to 14, and it, most of the um, the young people were from Jersey City and Union City, right? in that area, although it was open to our entire catchment area. And that was um, gratefully because of the Washington Park um, Association that uh, underwrote the expenses for the camp so that it was a totally um, free experience for those who took it. And they got to be introduced to wonderful activities and organizations like, um, like this one. But one of the things I was struck with after you guys went around, you, you know, everyone went around and did the... Um, you know, the viewing and, and then the group sat down together and, and for our viewers, they did this great activity after that where they made um, bird feeders <laughs> that they could, you know, keep. Um, and we can talk about that in a minute. But what I was really interested by is you were logging in the birds that you saw on an app. You were explaining that to, um, you know, to our group. Could you talk a little bit about that? I thought that that was a really interesting piece of, is that something you do with each of your yeah, I, when your group goes out, is that kind of a, a part of it each time? Yeah, it definitely is. And I don't know, Harriet, if you also have the little maps near you, since it seems like you have all of our materials. But I can, I can, I can kick us off, and then Harriet can can uh, can talk a bit more about where that data goes. Um, but yeah, I think you know, there's there's different kinds of bird watching and birders. The community is, you know, they've got people who are really intensely involved in the data collection, and you know, obviously, birds are kind of a bellwether for a lot of the climate change um, and its impact. So you'll see migratory patterns change. Changing, you'll see bird populations rising and decreasing, unfortunately, you know, often decreasing over time. Um, and so one way to really understand what's happening is to log bird observations. And that observational data, again, is going to Cornell through eBird. Um, they have an amazing program. Uh, so as a, as a way of kind of engaging in the science, you can log your data and upload that. I think they're also very competitive birders. Um, I don't I'm personally not a very competitive birder, but they do exist. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's, you know, there's a lot of how many birds have you seen this year? How many species have you seen? How many species have you seen over your lifetime? And people will kind of go, it's like a real life Pokemon. You know, they like go and they try to collect them all. Um, and so for that reason, a lot of people have maintained personal lists. I think the internet allows us to connect all these personal lists and start to see larger trends, right, in the science. So for me, it's very important to be keeping track. And I, I think, um, especially with these young people that we were just meeting for the first time, mm -hmm. kind of showing them what they saw and reminding them that they saw 10 different species in just this one little park over an hour um, is pretty cool. You know, it really shows you something about biodiversity. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of what we were doing when we were there we're logging it. Um, Harriet, if you've got like the materials, you can kind of show, yeah. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Um, well, yeah, I guess this is this is what sort of comes out of, I mean, there's a lot of science that comes out of um, the observations, but this is a simple representation of where the birds will be throughout the year. So this is just your, your <laughs> the camera is mirrored, so. I know, it's hard to remember, <laughs> no, which side things are gonna pop yeah. up. Sorry, I put, totally put you on the spot in a very tricky way and I don't have to do anything, so. <laughs> Sorry you're doing, that. You're doing great, Harry, keep it up, Thank keep you. going. So here we have the American robin, which is, you know, we see we see all over the US, it's very, um, a very common bird to see, but you can also see that it travels as well, that it has, that it has these different colors represent different times of the year. Um, which is something I mean, I didn't know about the robin before. Um, whereas you have something like the the house sparrow, which is actually prevalent all the way across, <laughs> all the way down to to South America. Um, so they put them together and they can create they create these um, these sort of moving maps of migration, so you can really see where the birds are, how far they're they're traveling um, during the seasons. Which is just I mean that's a very simple and um, intuitive way of feeding the connection all across the, the, the planet. With. And I think it's kind of important also to tell young people about the fact that they can also take part in science, right? And that they too are scientists. 
um, you know, kind of as a as a young person, I, I studied physics a long time ago, and there were really like so few women and girls who were in STEM at that time. And um, you know, it was uh, I, I so as a, as a as an adult now, I always feel like going and telling, especially young girls and and underrepresented groups in STEM, like you can do this too. It's not hard. It's really fun. Um, you can get enjoyment out of it. Um, and you can also like learn about birds in the process, you know? So, yeah. oh, some lovely pictures of us yeah, looking quite nerdy. Some of the shots. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> these are some of the shots that I took on, uh, when I was with you guys on, uh, with you on Wednesday. And I have to say, you know, um, and a shout out to Ilian, who's our, um, uh, mission impact coordinator who focuses on girls. And there she is in orange. Um, YW signature color. And uh, she, you know, organized this entire week's camp working alongside with the um, uh, key person from the Rutgers 4-H and the two of them have done an amazing job in engaging everyone. And you know what I wanted to say, what I, I'm also so impressed about your organization and how it also kind of fit into the bigger picture of what we were trying to do is exactly what you're saying, Kasha, is that, you know, we want young people to understand um, especially, as you said, groups that are underrepresented in the sciences and in, in kind of that STEM picture, that this is accessible to them. And there's lots of different ways that you can get engaged to STEM. And that sometimes, you know, we have this vision that, you know, I know, and I'm much older than these young people um, that were in this, but, you know, you grow up with this vision of what a scientist is, is in a lab coat with a, with a um, let's say, a, a, a microscope. But the reality of it is both of you are in sciences, both of you and your, with your jobs. And it's important for us to reframe that picture for young people and especially for young women, because we know that women are underrepresented, an underrepresented group in the STEM, in STEM environments um, and show them other options and ways that they can get engaged. Uh, we also know that um, we get closer to equality through economic self-sufficiency, for sure, and that the STEM, you know, uh, positions and professions definitely are some of the higher paid professions, for sure. So we definitely, you know, not that we want to push people to make money, but we definitely want to push um, opportunities for equality um, and accessibility to those. And so that, I think, is another key piece of what this camp has been about. And the morning right before you all came... Um, what they focused on was talking more about activism and talking about, you know, ways to be engaged in your community and making sure that the, the um, values and the, what's important to, to each of us, you know, you know, that we have the ability to help promote and support um, those values in our communities in different ways. And that's what I really love about your organization because there's so much wrapped up in it. I mean, obviously there's birding, but it is connected to climate change. It is connected to inclusivity. It is connected to supporting our um, LGBTQI plus communities. And, and it, it just, it's a, it's a, it really, you know, shows again that um, we can be engaged in activism in so many different ways, <laughs> um, which I really appreciate because sometimes people feel like, oh, I'm not the type of person to go and, you know, carry a sign at some kind of march, it's not my thing. And it doesn't have to be your thing. And that's not the only way to be an activist is what I always tell people. Yeah, it can be really fun. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, get to, you get to connect with your community and learn about something personally and contribute to a larger cause at the same time. Um, you know, and that I think is was important for both of us, and that's kind of why we thought, why don't we start something? You know, obviously with the with the support of the national organization, um, they're very supportive of local chapters because activism and and even kind of climate activism is local. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's about the decisions that are made about our public parks, you know, at the local level, and then it's also about you know uh, at the at the at the global level too. But we we can play a part um, definitely within our communities. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I love how, uh, it, again, it's so um, the ability to really individually empower people as well as collectively empower people in terms of, you know, the messages. So I really, um, really, really appreciate that. So I have two questions I want to ask you both before we sign off. And I'm so grateful, again, that you were able to spend some time with us today and, and push this out again for our viewers. Please make sure that you follow 
on the Instagram page. And again, if you want to learn more about eBird.org, the link is there as well. But my one's connected to birding and one's connected to activism, my question. So my birding question is, um, what is the most exciting bird that you've ever seen? And I don't know, is that something, it maybe it's like a favorite, so that's hard to pick, but I'm curious in your Jersey City habitat that now you have started this organization is, what's the most exciting bird that you've seen? And so I, our viewers can kind of get excited to get out there and try to find. Harriet? I have one. I have one. It's actually, we, we commemorated it because it was so exciting to see. Look at me with all my... <laughs> I love that. This is it's too shiny. This is the pileated woodpecker. And uh, ah. during the pandemic, it's the biggest woodpecker in the country. Should I say world? Maybe not. Um, and uh, uh, during the pandemic, it seemed like everybody had seen this woodpecker and they were posting about it. Um, and it's not it's not that uncommon, but I hadn't seen it. And we went out a few times. We went birding uh, with the explicit purpose of finding this woodpecker. <laughs> and Kasha had already seen it before, um, but still exciting. And we went, um, we ended up, it's like the fourth time we went to the same place and it is the Roger, Charles E. Rogers, I think. It's near Princeton. Okay. It's a little bit farther south. Um, and we went and we, we got there for sort of 7 a.m. because the, the, these are early birds. Because we checked on eBird and the people that had birded and seen the palliated woodpecker. Um, it's seen at 7 a.m. So we went and we finally saw it. Um, the bird was so nonchalant. Just flew out, so pecky, and we were both like, oh my gosh. <laughs> we, we might have shed a few tears. I mean, it was that exciting. It's like we'd been looking for this bird. Um, that was exciting. Yeah, that was a really exciting moment. You took mine. That was gonna be mine. I guess um, we went for a walk at Decourt Park um, mm -hmm. just a few weekends ago. And something that, you know, as, as you bird, you start to see new things. You've seen the same birds before, but you start to recognize new things because you're a little bit more attuned to them now. And something that this year I've just started to really get excited by are the baby birds which are just so incredibly cute. And um, we saw this kind of display, not not to kind of humanize the, the birds or anthropomorphize the birds, but it was kind of amazing. And it felt a lot like a lot of parenting displays I see in humans, mm -hmm. which was that the two parent terns, and terns are um, a kind of um, water bird, where they're around the water. Um, they were trying to basically bribe a baby tern to fly. And so the two parent terns were sitting with little yummy looking fish in their mouths and the baby was down the banister on the ground just being like can you please feed me and you could just see this exchange that was happening between these parents that were like come up here and we'll feed you and the baby's like i'm hungry you know and it just kept going back and forth and back and forth and finally the baby bird was like all right fine and it flew up under the banister and then it got to eat the fish and I th that was wow. just like an amazing moment to watch and that was just a few weekends uh weekends ago Wow, that is amazing. And yeah, I can attest bribery is a big part of parenting. <laughs> I'm not saying that's the way that, that parents <laughs> should be parenting. Yeah, I don't no, know. No, I'm no. completely I'm agnostic, sure. but it was pretty funny. That's amazing. Wow. And and I I um I, I, I love the woodpecker. I have to say, as we all can see, I'm sitting outside and, and I shared that um very often I have a red cardinal that comes and sits next to me and over these months that I've been out here comes and sits pretty close. So I'm always amazed. But the the bird that he, out here that I've been trying to see because I hear it is the owl. Um, I always hear an owl. And I can tell that it must be pretty close. And I even took out binoculars a few months ago to try to see if I could, you know, zero in on it. So that's my goal is to find the owl that's out here in my trees. I just I was listening to it while you all were talking. So um. So Don't I give love, up. That's going to be amazing when you finally see the owl. I love More the goals. You know, I don't. I don't. But other people, I mean, are, are all of our neighbors hear it? My son says he saw it once, but I'm not sure. You know, he wasn't able to describe it exactly. But um, I'm, you know, we're very interested and intrigued to try to find our owl. So um, if you if you are hearing it, there's kind of like a Shazam for bird sounds. Ah. And it's it's an app called Merlin, and uh, you could just kind of like Shazam it, basically. It'll tell you exactly, you know, if it's it a is. recognizable. There it is. There's Merlin. I'm gonna download it. Yeah. So then you can actually like listen to the sound, and if it is recognizable, it will tell you what it thinks it is. It's some pretty cool AI. That's so great. That's so great. All right, everyone. You also have one more tool for your for your outing. <laughs> and my last question, really quick, because I know we have to wrap up, is 
because again, I love that um, you all started something and I'm always trying to uh, encourage folks to kind of take a dream or an idea they have and follow, you know, just kind of feel empowered that they can follow it, you know, and, and, and create if they, if they want to, um, you know, any, any words to, uh, that you learned along the way in terms of setting and starting, you know, this organization up so that if someone has a similar idea, even if it's in a different area that, you know, was helpful to you getting it to this point. Yeah, I would say, I would say we definitely have 100% really benefited from the Feminist Bird Club being the umbrella for this organization because they've set up if so, so many things in place and they've, they've gone through a lot of sort of trial and error at the beginning, they can give us advice and there's this community that's already built. So we have like this Slack channel, um, we can ask questions and get advice. So we, so we asked about teaching kids um, about birding and people were able to come back with some um, really uh, useful things and tools for us. So that, so that if, if there's, if there's a way that this has been done before and, and you can, ask other people how it's done that's definitely um helpful starting with another person too <laughs> um uh take some of the some of the pressure off but it's mostly it was really quite simple i mean what we have set up now is an is an instagram and a mailing list um we're probably going to try and put together a website at some point but it but it really is as simple as just trying to get the word out in whatever free way um you can people yeah i'd say you know starting small but trying to kind of network big so um like harriet said starting as a chapter of a national organization was like totally doable we both have jobs and mm -hmm. lives and things and you know this was kind of like a side thing that we just love and so we weren't looking for this to become a full-time gig right like we don't want it to take that much time um but we are pretty passionate about it. So it's like, let's just start really small. We're not even gonna be the feminist bird club of New Jersey. We're just gonna, let's just say Jersey city and we're not gonna be exclusive about it, but let's not try to go like too big. Mm -hmm. And then we basically have friends in the area and we said, just come on a bird walk, you know? And then the word got out and, and now it's it's kind of building momentum. Um, and then we also connected with as many organizations uh, as we could find in Jersey, in New Jersey more broadly, just to say like, hi, we're new here you know, you've been birding for 25 years, like, what should we know? Are there spots you love? You know, can we get coffee? Um, so starting really small, but like trying to make friends and learn from others who are in the space, that, that's been really helpful for us. Well, that's great. Mute. That's great advice from both of you. So um, have, you know, have a network that you can go to, have a partner that you can do together and, um, you know, connect if you can to, a, 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 you know, start small and you know, connect to a greater organization too, so that you can, um, you know, why recreate the wheel if there's something there, have an infrastructure to be able to build into. That's great advice. And that's something that you can um, take with you no matter what your idea is. Those are really great pieces. So thank you for sharing them. To our viewers, thank you for spending this Friday with us. As you know, we love to educate and inspire you. And I know I really enjoyed this time with Tasha and Harriet today. I enjoyed being with them on Wednesday. I was so excited to talk to you today because of everything I got to see in action. And I hope all of you watching uh, make a point to follow um, their Instagram, join their mailing list. We have the link for their mailing list right dropped into our comments here. Um, Gina Fusello said, woohoo, she's a big fan. <laughs> she's, she's watching and cheering you guys on uh, today. And um, we hope that you follow and participate in some of the great activities. And as for YW activities, for any um, BIPOC women in our community, we are getting ready to launch our um, opportunity to help you start businesses. Um, and so please, we, it's a free opportunity. Um, it's part of our Women's Empowerment 360 programs. It's specifically um, set up for BIPOC women entrepreneurs to launch their own businesses. Applications um, are here and the, the program's kicking off. This is our second cycle with it. And it's kicking off on September 9th. So please sign up if, or, or share the information with somebody. And also, um, for any of the seniors in our community, we have a free online Healthy Mind, Healthy Life teletherapy support group for you. Um, please um, consider joining. It's going on now until November 1st. Um, my 90-year-old mother has been doing it, and she loves it. And, and I encourage all of you, Sarah Hilson-Burson, who 
um, is the social worker who runs it is amazing. And it's such a, it's a wonderful safe space for you to engage and talk about your feelings and experiences, especially now when maybe you can't get out as much as um, you, you know, we normally have. And also one last plug on August 18th, we are doing a motherhood uncensored event called helping kids transition into school. Um, those of us who do have kids entering the school system, doesn't matter if they're eight-year-olds like mine or seniors in high school, um, we have a lot on our minds about putting them back into school. And, um, you know, I know for myself, I'm concerned, you know, I, I want them to be, you know, safe. I'm happy that there's masks. Um, you know, I, I want people to be vaccinated. I'm all for science and data, <laughs> um, you know, ruling the decisions we make. Um, but there's a lot to think about with kids returning to school. So we have a wonderful panel pulled together for you with a social worker um, and a, um, a pediatrician, you know, to be talking to you about all the concerns that, you know, could be going on um, both um, physically, you know, um, for their physical health and mentally in terms of the socialization and the returning into that environment because some kids are excited to go back, others are not so much. Um, and so helping manage that. And there's a great, um, we have a great speaker who's going to talk to us about packing school lunches again, because I don't know about you, but I was really happy not to have to do that for a year, but they're back. So, um, <laughs> so that's, there'll be some information there. So with that, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. And um, thank you so much to Kasha and Harriet for sharing um, the wonderful community that you have created. And um, I look forward to following you and, and hopefully popping up at one of your events with my two little birders. Um, and uh, I'll be, if I find my owl, I'm gonna let you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, gonna, please do. I'm going to be looking. We're invested now. We want to know. I know. I, I, I'm actually, now that I know between Merlin and this other eBird, I mean, I feel like I have more tools to be able to uh, to locate, locate him or her. So with that, everyone have a great day. Have a great Thank weekend. You. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>